Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining tonight's forum, Belmont's Road to Housing Equity. I am Rachel Heller, co-chair of the Belmont Housing Trust and CEO of the statewide affordable housing nonprofit, Citizens Housing and Planning Association. I'd like to start by thanking the sponsors of the event, Belmont Housing Trust, Belmont Human Rights Commission, Belmont Against Racism, and the Belmont Media Center. The goal of tonight's event is to learn about the history of the Fair Housing Act, Belmont's housing needs, and to think about opportunities for equitable development here in town that can foster inclusive, welcoming, and vibrant neighborhoods. We are going to hear from a really incredible group of speakers. I will introduce each of them just before they speak. If you have any questions, please hold them until the end when we will have a question and answer part of the program. This event is being recorded by the Belmont Media Center. We all know that home prices and rents are outpacing incomes here in Belmont and throughout the greater Boston area. In Belmont, housing prices have increased by more than 40% since 2009, making Belmont increasingly inaccessible to households with low and moderate incomes. In fact, nearly 25% of Belmont's current households are eligible for affordable housing. Belmont has a path forward for expanding affordable housing opportunities in our town. Our housing production plan identifies strategies for putting zoning, funding, and policies into place to develop more of the homes that we need. And that will benefit all of us, creating a diversity of housing types at various price points. And that can create opportunities for our community to become more diverse, as well as walkable, bikeable, and supportive of our local businesses. We have new state laws that we'll talk about tonight that will help Belmont put zoning in place over the next several months to expand housing opportunity, inclusion, and strengthen our community. We're starting off tonight's discussion with Representative Dave Rogers. Representative Rogers is a leader on affordable housing in the state legislature. He is going to talk about the new state laws that will help Belmont put new zoning into place. And I just have to say, it's an honor to be both a constituent of Representative Rogers and to uh, work with him in the state house. Representative Rogers. Thank you for the introduction, Rachel. And um, it's great to partner with you at CHAPA. Uh, thanks to all the sponsors for this important event. Uh, you're right, we just finished the state budget actually last night around uh, 2.30 2 a.m. So we're done on the house side. And uh, it's a very good budget for housing. We increased uh, the mass rental voucher program. We increased RAF, which is residential assistance to families in transition. So it's a pretty good budget for housing. Um, but it, it is fair to say that we have a, an affordable housing crisis in Massachusetts. And that's true for a, a lot of reasons. Um, you know, candidly, some of it is a good reason, um, you know, in, in, in the sense that um, other than Dallas, Fort Worth, the greater Boston area is one of the fastest growing and most vibrant and dynamic uh, economic centers, not really just in America, certainly, but really around the world. And we now rival Silicon Valley uh, in biopharma, in high tech, artificial intelligence. And when you go to Kendall Square, you get off the red line, you throw a rock, you'll hit a tech company. And there are a lot of great jobs, not just in the greater Boston area, but throughout the state. But what that's meant is um, rapidly rising housing uh, costs. And um, if you're in the market um, and you were lucky enough to buy 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago, um, you know, you have an asset that's appreciated a great deal. But for countless other of our uh, friends and neighbors uh, here in the Commonwealth, um, uh, housing is getting out of reach to, to achieve the American dream to buy your first home. If you're a renter, you know, the benchmark is that rent should take up no more than 25 to 30, 33% of your rent for many families and individuals around the Commonwealth, much higher than that, that they're paying in disposable income. Uh, we did just pass a new law that Rachel alluded to uh, through the economic development legislation last year that will change our zoning rules so that, um, for instance, town meetings around the state can vote uh, on changes to um, uh, zoning laws with a simple majority rather than the two thirds that was previously required. And this will, so that multifamily housing, um, accessory dwelling units, 
things to boost production, uh, it'll be easier. And again, it's a democratic rule. It is still a majority vote required. I, I think it's sensible. Uh, it comes really from the governor. The governor proposes a Republican governor. And part of the theory is when you have an affordable housing crisis, you need more housing. And so that's part of um, uh, the new law. Um, I've introduced a number of pieces of legislation to address our affordable housing crisis, everything from I introduced a rent control bill to debate that. Even within the uh, affordable housing community, there's a, a vibrant debate as to whether rent control is a good idea. It was defeated, it was in Massachusetts for a long time, only three places had it, Boston, Cambridge, and uh, Brookline. They put it on a statewide ballot and, and that's how they got rid of rent control, but it was really tight. It was 51-49, I think, that it was voted out. And so I introduced that to kick off a debate about that. I uh, have a number of bills I filed with CHAPA, uh, including an act to affirmative, affirmatively further fair housing uh, filed with Representative Santiago from Boston, who's now running for mayor of Boston, uh, creates a, an affirmative statewide duty to further uh, fair housing so that all the entities at the state level, public housing entities, will have various uh, affirmative obligations and it creates a commission um, to uh, come up with ideas to create diverse, inclusive uh, housing. Um, I mentioned, um, of course, the rent control bill. Uh, I, another one I've filed is an act establishing a fair housing disparate impact standard. So if you talk to litigators, people who, who litigate civil rights cases, um, housing cases, there's uh, laws that have a discriminatory intent um, so-called de jure is discrimination, meaning it's written right into the law, like school desegregation, the school segregated schools. But there are a lot of laws that can have a so-called disparate impact. That is, on the face of the law, they are not discriminatory, but their resulting impact on the market is discriminatory. And so that, that piece of legislation is designed to uh, address that issue and, and make sure that our state laws uh, don't have a disparate impact when it comes to housing. Um, you know, the final bill is I have a right to counsel bill, which will create a right to house uh, a lawyer for people facing eviction. Um, you know, in, in criminal court, if you're low income and you're accused of a crime, you get a lawyer, but in civil court, you do not. 90% um, of landlords have a lawyer, only 10% of tenants do. So um, that, that legislation has got a lot of attention. The former state uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice endorsed it. The Boston Globe has endorsed it. Um, so I know you have a, a kind of a, a big panel of folks. I don't want to talk too long. Uh, I'm uh, eager to participate, answer questions, and, and listen to all the other panelists as well. So um, thank you for this opportunity. I think it's timely, it's important, and I really commend um, everyone for put, for putting this together and, and so thank you. Thank you so much, Representative. Um, we will now hear from Bob Terrell on the history of the Fair Housing Act. Bob is a member of CHAPA's Fair Housing Committee and he brings great experience to the committee having served as the executive director of the Fair Housing Center of Greater Boston and as a member of Boston's Assessment of Fair Housing's Community Advisory Committee. Bob is also a part-time lecturer in the Department of Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning at Tufts University. Bob, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, Rachel, thank you very much and to uh, the rest of the group for your kind invitation. Um, it's been a while since I've uh, been in Belmont, even though we're here uh, virtually. I was there about four or five years ago to do a fair housing training for the Housing Trust. Um, so it's very, very nice to be back. Uh, my presentation is going to be divided into three parts. Um, I'll, I'll be fairly brief so we can move as quickly as we can to Q&A at the end of our sessions. Uh, one is just the historical background of the Fair Housing Act. Uh, secondly, some of the major elements of the Fair Housing Act that all civil rights and fair housing activists should be aware of. And last but not least, some of the outstanding issues and challenges that we face in the civil rights movement today. A little bit of the background history. Uh, this bill is properly named the Civil Rights Act of 1968 
Title VIII of which is referred to as the Fair Housing Act. And at the time it was passed by the United States Congress, the country was going through a period of very intense uh, political and racial turmoil. Uh, we had just come through the 1967 uh, urban rebellions, uh, mainly because of confrontations between people in the African-American community and the police. That might uh, uh, sound familiar given what we're going through today. Also, the civil rights movement itself was going through uh, a couple of shifts. The organizing began to focus on northern urban cities um, with housing being at the center of, of the controversy, particularly in the city of Chicago with the fair housing movement there. And also there was a shift in the civil rights movement. There was a big debate over whether or not the tactics of nonviolent, non-cooperation was any longer viable. So it was a, a, a very, very contentious time. There were attempts in 66 and 67 to get this civil rights bill passed. Uh, it was blocked. Uh, there was a lot of conservative backlash in Congress uh, because of the intensity of the civil rights movement. And Senators Mondale and Brooke uh, Senator Brooke being the African-American senator from Massachusetts at the time, were working very hard uh, to get this bill passed. Uh, but it was also being stalled by the, the uh, House Rules Committee on the House side, which was chaired by a Southern Democrat who was very much opposed to the passage of civil rights laws. But then events took hold in 1968 that really began to change the conversation. One was the publishing of the Kerner Commission report. Uh, this report was uh, commissioned by President Johnson. Uh, the commission report was very famous for saying that the United States was becoming uh, two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. And housing took up a huge section of that report. Uh, that gave people like Mondale and Brooke and others a little bit more impetus to push uh, for the 68 bill. And unfortunately, the thing that really uh, pushed the bill through Congress, unfortunately, was the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King on April the 4th. Uh, Senator Mondale went to the floor of the Senate and gave a very impassioned speech on the need for this bill to pass. And President Johnson uh, came out publicly and said, this bill must pass so we can memorialize the work of Dr. King. And uh, the Congress passed the bill. And on April the 11th, the 1968 Civil Rights Act was signed into law. It, was, it wasn't, as Mondale and others pointed out, it was not a perfect bill. Uh, there had been a lot of concessions. It was badly flawed. Uh, one of the unfortunate aspects at that time was there wasn't very much in the way of enforcement powers uh, that were given to HUD to enforce this act. Uh, but people kept working at it. And interestingly enough, in the very last month or so of the Reagan administration, 20 years later in September of 1988, they passed the uh, Fair Housing Act amendments, which greatly strengthened the Fair Housing Act and also added two more protected classes. When we refer to the Fair Housing Act today, this is really the law that we're talking about after the 88 amendments. And I want to go through some of the major aspects of that law and why it's so important for us today. Uh, the first thing I want to point out, and this is something that comes up in fair housing and civil rights debates quite often, what was the real legislative intent of the Fair Housing Act? 
simply stated to provide equal access to housing and freedom of choice, giving people the, the ability to choose where they want to live. Housing discrimination is not just something that is inconvenient, something that makes us angry, uh, something that puts us uh, in great distress. It is illegal. Um, it is a violation of federal, hall, uh, federal law to engage in any form of housing discrimination. That covers rental, sales, financing, insuring, it covers all types of real estate transactions and all kinds of housing. Uh, there is in the, in the law uh, some exemptions. I won't go into the details of the exemptions, um, which was the result of some political compromises that were struck uh, in the Congress. The Fair Housing Act is very clear. It clearly defines what discrimination is it describes what are discriminatory acts and practices. Uh, in one section of the, of the act, it gives a long list of examples of what we mean by housing discrimination. Uh, so it's very, very clear what the do's and the don'ts are under the Fair Housing Act. It covers also real estate professionals, brokers, landlords, and property managers in the execution of their work. The thing that makes the Fair Housing Act a very serious and central civil rights law, it creates what we call protected classes. All real serious civil rights bills make it very clear that there are special groups of people in our society that are now given special rights and protections and remedies at law because they're part of a group that has historically been discriminated against. Originally, race, color, gender, religion, and national origin were the five original protected classes. Given the 1988 amendments, we added families with children and persons with disabilities. Um, with regard to disability access, the act also established design and construction guidelines in order to make housing fully accessible and it applies to all buildings, five units and up. There is now a push on to add uh, survivors of domestic violence and members of the LBGT uh, BT, uh, community um, to make them protected classes. In fact, there were a couple of recent uh, court decisions that are pushing in that direction to extend the protections of the Fair Housing Act to members of that community. Also, the Fair Housing Act was greatly strengthened because HUD was given true enforcement power to deal with complaints. It establishes uh, the Office of the Administrative Law Judge uh, to adjudicate those cases and to give out uh, damages, cover legal fees, et cetera. Also under the Fair Housing Act, if for any reason you disagree um, with the decision that HUD has rendered or any other uh, state or local agency that is hearing a fair housing case, you have the right to judicial review. You can take it to a court of competent jurisdiction. In order to expand the coverage of the Fair Housing Act, they established the principle of substantial equivalency, which means that any state or local agency uh, that wants to qualify for funding from HUD to do its fair housing work it must become substantially equivalent to HUD. That means you have to pass local legislation such that your agency is able to provide the same protections and provisions and remedies that HUD would be able to provide under the act. 
Uh, when I went to work at the Boston Fair Housing Commission some years ago, that was one of my three assignments uh, to make sure that our commission became substantially equivalent and we had to pass the proper legislation through our city council, uh, send a home rule petition to the legislature. And once that passed, we were able to uh, change our local ordinance and give the commission the power that we wanted it to have. Also under the Fair Housing Act, uh, they began to fund those agencies that were substantially equivalent and to fund nonprofit institutions like the Fair Housing Center where I used to work. Again, trying to broaden the fair housing infrastructure throughout the country. We refer to that as FAP funding. That's the money that went to government agencies and the FIP funding went to local nonprofits. And there's a network of nonprofits about 60 or 70 of them all across the country doing fair housing work. In the state of Massachusetts, our three FAP agencies are the Cambridge Human Rights Commission, the Boston Fair Housing Commission, and the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination. We also have four FIP agencies in Worcester, uh, in Southeast Massachusetts, uh, at Suffolk University, and the Massachusetts Fair Housing Center, which covers the western part of the state. So we have four FIP agencies. Uh, one of the big controversies is, do we uh, need to increase the funding to those agencies and even expand and build more infrastructure throughout the country? So we can really go after fair housing enforcement. The last two sections of the act I wanna focus on is affirmatively furthering fair housing. Uh, this is a very important aspect of the law. Uh, it basically mandates that not only HUD, but anybody that HUD funds uh, should be actively, proactively pursuing the enforcement of the Fair Housing Act and taking affirmative steps, not just to follow the letter of the law, but to be really proactive and creative about urging people to uh, support inclusive communities, breaking down segregated housing markets, and of course, increasing enforcement of the Fair Housing Act. Last but not least, the Fair Housing Act makes it very, very clear that it will not tolerate any repri reprisals or retaliation against people who bring a fair housing complaint. And it has very, very strict rules about how those folks, if found guilty of such retaliation, will be treated, up to and including a fine and possible imprisonment uh, in, a, in a federal prison. The act takes it very, very seriously that people have a right to file a complaint and they don't want anyone threatened if they do. The major challenges that we face going forward um, in the fair housing mo movement, uh, again, affirmatively furthering fair housing is gonna make a comeback. There were attempts in the previous administration to water down and undermine that regulation. The Biden administration under Secretary Fudge has already taken the first steps uh, to start the regulatory process to bring back what we refer to in the business as the Obama regulation um, so that we can start getting assessments of fair housing written in files from cities and towns and housing authorities all over the country. Uh, we just concluded such a task in the city of Boston and our new assessment of fair housing is on uh, the desk of our, our new mayor, uh, Mayor Janey, and hopefully soon she will put together an executive order to implement that assessment of fair housing uh, that we worked so hard on for four or five years. There's lingering controversy around the efficacy of mobility programs and the whole uh, opportunity approach uh, to neighborhood development and desegregation. Uh, there's the role that anti-displacement preferences need to play 
uh, in protecting particularly communities of color from gentrification and displacement and whether or not those preferences uh, fall within the purview of the Fair Housing Act. Most of us feel that there's no contradiction between taking affirmative steps to stop displacement and do not see that as a violation of the Fair Housing Act, but it's a growing controversy. Disparate impact, you just heard from Representative Rogers talk about uh, an attempt to have uh, a state law passed where we institutionalized the use of di disparate impact legal theory. Uh, there was an, an attempt by the previous administration in Washington to undercut the use of disparate impact. And that too is gonna be uh, brought back and resurrected by the Biden administration, a very powerful uh, tool that we use when we litigate particular kinds of fair housing cases. And last but not least, the issue of zoning. I'm proud to say that the city of Boston just recently became the first city in the United States to put fair housing language and principles and values into our zoning code, thanks to the hard work of city council Lydia Edwards and the community advisory committee that I was fortunate enough to serve on. Um, that was one of the key goals and action steps in our assessment of fair housing. And we were fortunate to have uh, Councillor Edwards pick up on that goal and run with it. And on December the 9th, we be became the first city in the country uh, to have such uh, fair housing language in its zoning code. We hope that that's going to serve as a model uh, for the zoning codes of other cities and towns throughout the state. So those are some of the outstanding challenges. That's a little bit of background on the Fair Housing Act. And I look forward to the uh, question and answer period later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. Bob talked about our responsibility to affirmatively further fair housing. Much of this, as Bob mentioned, has to do with zoning. Representative Rogers talked about changes at the state level to make it easier to zone for the kind of housing we need. Our next speaker will tell us more about why it is hard to put the zoning in place that we need and make changes to our zoning. We will now hear from Katherine Einstein, Associate Professor of Political Science and Assistant Director of Policy at the Center for Anti-Racist Research at BU. Katherine is the author of Neighborhood Defenders, Participatory Politics in America's Housing Crisis. Katherine will talk with us about the local housing and land use decision-making process, what drives the decision-making and the outcomes that we see. Catherine, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me here. Um, and to my fellow panelists, I'm already learning a lot being here. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today are community meetings, right? Um, and these are such an important part of local politics, um, and especially for whether or not the kind of housing that we need actually gets built. So because of the way that land use regulations and zoning are set up in most places in the United States, and certainly in communities like Belmont, basically any time that you want to build more than one unit of housing, whether it's affordable or for-profit market rate housing, you are going to find yourself before a planning or zoning board. And as part of that process, you are going to hear from members of the public who will express their views about these housing developments. Um, and one of the things that my colleagues, um, David Glick and Max Palmer at Boston University and I were really interested in understanding was whether these community forums um, were sort of serving to empower marginalized communities um, that had been sort of railroaded in previous um, land use regimes and they were serving this valuable check against greedy developers or whether in fact these community meetings serve as a tool by which privileged older white homeowners can block newcomers from coming to their community. 
So that's the central question that we're interested in understanding. And so to answer this question, we read thousands of pages of meeting minutes across 97 cities and towns in the greater Boston and central Massachusetts area. And we looked um, at both in-person meetings across a three-year period. And we also actually, um, between March and September of 2020, examined Zoom meetings so we could understand how those dynamics might change as we, we move to this sort of strange virtual world that we've now all become habituated to. And what we wanted to understand was the demographics of the folks who participated and what their preferences were over housing and how this shapes the construction of housing in the communities where we most desperately need it. And so one of the big punchlines of our research, something that we find across multiple communities, um, multiple types of projects um, in the Zoom era and in the in-person area, what we find is that land use regulations create opportunities for a group of individuals that we call neighborhood defenders to stop or delay the construction of new housing, big developments and small developments, affordable housing and market rate housing. So rather than serving as a way to sort of help marginalized communities protect themselves, they in fact, we find in our research, serve as a powerful tool by which privileged communities maintain their privilege. And the, the consequences of these community meetings are profound, especially in sort of rapidly growing regions like the greater Boston area. They contribute to exploding housing costs and racial and income segregation by creating obstacles to the construction of dense multifamily developments. They also create these really important political inequalities by empowering unrepresentative groups of older white homeowners to control their neighborhoods. And they also fragment housing reform coalitions. In some ways, these dynamics actually make it harder for us to create coalitions across different groups around common goals um, to further fair housing. So to give you guys a little bit more detail and how, how we went about doing this research, um, what some of the exact numbers are behind those sort of big broad uh, strokes that I just painted, um, what we did is we looked at planning and zoning board meetings from 97 cities and towns in Massachusetts. And you know, this is a forum in Belmont um, in so many of the places that we studied. We studied Belmont um, and we studied a lot of other communities that look like Belmont. But these dynamics actually manifest across a really wide variety of places. So we also looked at some um, larger, denser places like Cambridge. Um, and we also looked at sort of more deindustrializing communities like Worcester, um, Lawrence, Lowell. So the, these are dynamics that really persist across a really diverse subset of communities. And what we did is we collected um, meeting transcripts um, or meeting minutes from every single meeting that discussed the construction of more than one unit of housing. So this could be like anything from like a little infill development or an accessory dwelling unit to a massive apartment complex. And we studied both affordable and market rate developments. Um, and one really um, important feature for us um, as data analysts is these meeting minutes featured the names addresses and positions taken on proposed housing developments. Um, and in some cases, in about 50% of cases, the meeting minutes actually provided really interesting details on the reasons folks gave for either supporting or opposing a housing development. And so for these in-person data, we um, analyzed three about 3,000 commenters who made 4,200 comments. Because we had the names and addresses of individuals, we were actually able to merge them with administrative data like voter files and property records so that we could compare the demographics of commenters with voters in their community. And I wanna stress here, our comparison group is voters, not the general public. And we know from a lot of other research that voters are already advantaged relative to the general public on some really important dimensions. So if anything, these differences that I'm showing you here would be even larger if I was comparing commenters to the general public. And what we find in our in-person data is that people who show up to public meetings are more likely to be men, they're more likely to be white, and they are way more likely to be over the age of 50 and homeowners. Um, and so these are really striking demographic disparities. These are actually much bigger than the kinds of demographic disparities that you'll find when you look at other forms of participatory inequality, like voting um, or even running for office, right? Um, 
one other sort of really important finding that we have is that the folks who show up to these hearings are overwhelmingly opposed to the construction of new housing. So only 14% of people show up to these hearings in support of new housing. And this pattern, again, persists across every single community we study. There is not a single community that we look at where a majority of people show up in support of the construction of new housing. This is also a pattern that persists across project type. We see profound opposition to affordable housing and to market rate housing, to big projects and to really small infill developments. Um, the one place where I would say we see perhaps the strongest and most uniform opposition, perhaps unsurprising to anyone who's been at a meeting around these issues, are for Chapter 40B projects. Um, those elicit a particularly um, strong opposition. But again, the overwhelming point that I want folks to take away from this research is that people show up to these meetings in strong opposition to the construction of new housing. And they cite all sorts of different reasons in opposition to new housing. Um, they talk about the environment, they talk about traffic. Um, one thing that I want to flag among supporters, supporters of new housing are relatively more likely to cite these important affordability concerns and support for things like denser communities. And so that's a distinctive interest among supporters. Um, but again, among opponents, we hear a lot about the environment and flooding. One thing I also want to flag, and this is actually from newer research um, that my colleagues, you and I have been working on, um, is folks are also really concerned about developers and strongly distrust developers. So this is data actually from a national poll um, of 20 of the 20 largest metropolitan areas in the country um, by some political scientists out at Stanford. And we analyzed the data to look at sort of how much people trust developers. And so this is data showing you the proportion of people in these cities that either trusted um, particular entities somewhat or trusted a lot. And uh, people love homeowners. So over 90% of them think homeowners are great. Um, in contrast, in these very democratic leaning cities, real estate developers were viewed as about as trustworthy as President Trump. Um, and so this is a really big problem when we think about both um, you know, assembling support for housing coalition, like uh, new housing projects, and also more generally thinking about zoning reform for very good reasons. And I'm happy to talk more about those reasons in a Q&A. People distrust developers. As a consequence of that distrust, um, we have this big obstacle to building new housing um, and this big obstacle to potentially assembling broader coalitions around zoning reform. Um, so one question that we got a lot in our research starting in that, you know, March 2020 is like, could Zoom solve these problems? If we could attend a community meeting from the comfort of our own homes and didn't have to like get lots of childcare and, you know, I could have, you know, my tea and be just relaxed at home, would that make people more likely to attend hearings? Um, and we really hoped actually that that would be the case because our research um, was really depressing and we were hoping to find like a nice neat policy solution. Um, and so we analyzed um, 800 commenters who made 1,000 comments across 76 cities and towns in Massachusetts who had um, meeting minutes available for their Zoom hearings. Um, and the disparities were remarkably similar in the Zoom hearings. We were really struck by this. Um, the folks who show up to these hearings are more likely to be white still. Um, and they're also perhaps surprisingly, given what we might have worried about, um, about digital literacy, they're also still dramatically more likely to be over the age of 50. And they're much, much more likely to be homeowners. So the disparities that exist in in-person meetings stay remarkably consistent in Zoom meetings. Um, and the oppositional bias also stays remarkably consistent. So only 13% of commenters at these Zoom hearings showed up in support of the construction of new housing. Um, and so it doesn't look like Zoom meetings are going to be this cure-all um, that transforms the dynamics of public participation. And one thing that I want to flag as potentially an important lesson about participation in Zoom meetings is just because we make it easier to participate um, and using some of the jargon of social science research, just because we reduce the cost of participation, that does not necessarily mean that we're going to make people more interested in participating, um, especially among those who maybe weakly prefer new housing, but they don't like care so much about it that they're going to attend a three hour zoning board meeting about it, right? So this is a really um, important challenge and something that I think um, further suggests that we should perhaps be rethinking um, how public involvement um, occurs in uh, housing development. 
All right. So what kinds of things do we actually hear about at these hearings and how are people affected? Um, they cite, uh, many of them are experts at these hearings. So um, for folks who've been to these hearings, you may be very familiar with the dynamic of people citing their legal expertise, their experience in architecture, their experience as like a traffic engineer, um, and they use that professional expertise um, as a tool for opposing the construction of new housing. Um, folks often organize with their neighbors, often through neighborhood associations or neighborhood councils. Sometimes they bring public officials like their local town meeting members or city council members to meetings. Uh, they threaten and then they file lawsuits. Um, so that's another really important tool um, that folks at these hearings use as a way of stopping the construction of new housing. And so sort of taking all of these findings in concert, what our research shows is that advantaged people and advantaged communities are more likely to show up in opposition to the construction of all types of new housing, big projects, little projects, affordable and market rate. And what this means is that advantaged neighborhoods and advantaged cities are protected from development. And this leaves less advantaged places really vulnerable to development and to gentrification pressures because they don't have this privileged group of people who are going to show up to these hearings um, and get the attention of local officials as they fight the construction of new housing. Um, and so, you know, after after thinking about this like really serious issue, this um, significant participatory inequality, what can we do about this? What can we at the local level do to really impact change? Um, and one thing I want to stress is land use reform is a really important part of this puzzle to having fairer housing in the greater Boston area and beyond. Um, but I want to stress this is only a part of the solution. Um, you know, zoning reform alone is obviously not going to make our community um, in, you know, fully inclusive and integrate in all these things, but it is a critical part of this puzzle. And we need to make it easier for cities and towns to upzone. We need to allow more high density housing by right. Um, and I think we need to be really strategic about what kinds of policy choices should be discussed at public hearings and whether we should have a system where every single infill development comes before um, a jury of the neighborhood um, at a planning and zoning board hearing. It creates a very ad hoc and unpredictable process. There also are some ways that we might reform public meetings and sort of more modest reforms that might help to um, solve some of these issues. And finally, we really need federal and state level resources to improve affordability and to produce the level of subsidized housing that we need in the greater Boston area. Um, so thank you. I'm really looking forward um, to hearing hearing from the other panelists and uh, the questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Catherine. You've given us a lot to think about. And um, I will say that even given the sobering statistics from Catherine, we already have um, a bit of a victory here in Belmont where 98% of town meeting actually voted for the zoning change at McLean for the new development of 150 new homes. So let's keep up that, that momentum and that and uh, keep keep uh, working for more changes like that. Um, so now, actually, right before we move to more local and really talk about what's happening here in Belmont, I want to make sure to thank uh, our new select board member, Mark Palillo, who's in the audience, and also planning board member, Thayer Donham. Um, so now we are going to uh, really zero in on Belmont. Um, we will learn about Belmont's housing needs and opportunities from housing trust members, Betsy Lipson and Judy Fines. Betsy Lipson is co-chair of Belmont's Housing Trust, a METCO board member, and principal of a consulting firm advancing social and environmental change. She's lived in Belmont for 18 years with her husband and three sons. Judy Fines is a member and former chair of the Housing Trust and has had, a, a, has had I'm sorry, a long career in research about housing policy and income inequality. She's an advocate for affordable housing and greater diversity in Belmont. Betsy and Judy are going to walk us through what's happening here in Belmont. Good evening, this is Judy and I am going to be the uh, first of the speakers uh, that Betsy will follow me. We've heard, just heard from Katie Einstein about how limited public participation can be in the decisions that shape our town's future. Belmont has the tools to do things differently and to move us toward a more vibrant and diverse town of homes for all, a town where the development can help sustain us financially in a way that our, will address our structural budget deficit. 
Responding to the call of the Fair Housing Act also responds to our local needs. I'm going to talk briefly about a major initiative from the Housing Trust that is heading us in that direction. Would it surprise you to learn that housing affordability is an issue for lots of Belmont residents now? Even before COVID-19 led to many lost jobs and reduced earnings, about a quarter of households in town were having to pay more than 30%. Oops, wrong slide. I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit on this slide. The, new, the, the initiative of the Housing Trust starts with our housing production plan, which was created out of a broad community process to tackle our housing challenges and expand opportunities for people to have affordable homes. The planning process helps us understand Belmont's housing needs and lay out a production plan to meet those needs. While following this plan helps Belmont to reach the state's 10% benchmark for affordable housing required under Chapter 40B, we can go beyond that. 10% is not the limit. We'll tell you more about 40B a little bit later. In fact, we have more need than that 10% right now here in town. The housing production plan specifies five strategies to add housing. These are the blue hexagons you can see on this slide. Redevelop underutilized sites, focus around transit nodes. That's gonna be a theme later this evening. Leverage public land, revitalize and preserve the community housing we already have and continue, continue education and outreach efforts. You can find the full housing production plan on the town's website at the Housing Trust's webpage. All right, now onto the affordability question. Would it surprise you to learn that housing affordability is an issue for lots of Belmont residents now? Even before COVID-19 led to many lost jobs and reduced earnings, about a quarter of households in town were having to pay more than 30% of their incomes toward housing. This was true for a substantial number of both homeowners and renters. Paying 30% of income for housing costs is the standard threshold from HUD. If you pay a greater proportion than that, you are considered housing cost burdened. Belmont needs more housing. The housing production plan makes that clear. We need all types of housing for seniors, for families with children, small for small households, for young people, and we need a mix of affordability options. The plan also has data on the racial income gap and housing gap in Belmont, the need for housing for people with extremely low incomes and the income gap between renters and homeowners. Changing our zoning to allow for more types of housing and more affordable housing advances a key goal of the Fair Housing Act, as you heard from Bob. This image from Portland, Oregon, is an example of creative zoning to encourage housing for different kinds of households and incomes. The city of Portland adopted a far reaching zoning reform in 2020 that will allow more accessory dwelling units, triplexes, fourplexers, clusters of cottages, basement apartments, and other types of missing middle housing for unexisting residential lots. So what is affordable housing? In Belmont, we often think of the homes and apartments that rent here for modest amounts. There used to be many more of these, but there still are some. The owners may have a long-term tenant or a family member living there, or they can afford to maintain modest rents so that more people can, can afford their units. But these kinds of situations, the naturally occurring ones at the top of the slide, aren't permanent. Old owners sell and new owners are likely to pay more and have higher carrying costs. Whoops, there go the units. For real affordability, we need deed restricted affordable housing, permanently or long-term set by legal restrictions on the properties. Deed restricted housing comes in a number of flavors. We'll hear more in a moment from Betsy about the market rate types, about 40B and inclusionary zoning. But we should also recognize that housing choice vouchers, low income housing tax credits and public housing provide long-term permanent or permanent affordability. We have all those in Belmont and we still need more. 
To pick up on where Judy left off, I'm going to describe how the Belmont Housing Trust is currently thinking about ways Belmont can increase affordable housing and what you can do to help. First, I'll start by describing tools Belmont has in place right now for increasing deed restricted market rate housing. We also need to have conversations about expanding subsidized housing in town. For example, that would be housing choice vouchers and public housing. But for the purposes of this presentation, we're gonna focus on deed restricted market rate housing. Next, I'll show an income eligibility and rent chart to introduce housing affordability levels. Then because we know that vocal support is the secret sauce for advancing affordable housing, I'll recap recent activities that have gotten terrific community support. And finally, I'll introduce new activities that have to do with proposed zoning changes that we are just now getting underway. 40B is the first of two tools I'll discuss that Belmont has for expanding affordable housing. The picture on this slide is of a 40B project underway right now, the McLean development. As Rachel mentioned, R McLean is a terrific example of how we can work collaboratively with a developer on a 40B development to achieve our goals. Over the course of more than a year, different town groups came together with the developer to create a plan that truly fits Belmont's housing needs. McLean will result in 40 for sale and 110 for rent homes with a mix of affordability and age-friendly options. The Housing Trust proposed doing the McLean project as a 40B because we saw the opportunity to use this as a tool to increase affordability. You might wonder what exactly is 40B and what does 10% mean? Massachusetts anti-snob zoning law, chapter 40B, is a mandate for inclusion that was put in place in the late 1960s. The law allows developers to appeal local denials of affordable housing proposals to a state override board. Because single family zoning limits housing density and otherwise makes rental housing hard to build and expensive to occupy, it reduces the number of people of color in low income households who can live there. 40B is a tool that helps to advance fair housing. The law's intent is to facilitate construction of affordable housing in communities where less than 10% of the housing stock is affordable. Chapter 40B enables local zoning boards of appeals to approve affordable housing developments under flexible rules if at least 20 to 25% of the units have long-term affordability restrictions. Since the early 1970s, Chapter 40B has been used to produce over 60,000 homes. Inclusionary zoning is another tool that we have in place to advance affordable housing. The way this works is when a developer builds a multi-unit building over six units, our zoning requires that a percentage of the units be set aside as deed restricted market rate affordable housing. There are inclusionary zoning homes in developments in Cushing Square, Oakley Village, and soon in Waverly Square. Two years ago, the Housing Trust worked with the planning board and town meeting to strengthen this ordinance by adjusting the numbers up to match our neighboring towns. Inclusionary zoning is another way to move forward on Belmont's housing goals. So how much are the rents in affordable rental housing and what incomes are eligible? Because this presentation is focused on deed restricted market rate housing like McLean and the new buildings in Cushing Square, these charts reflect those limits. Other types of affordable housing have different income and rent limits. All affordable housing programs income and rent limits are based on data provided annually by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. As you can see from these income limits, affordable housing does not always mean housing for low income households. Using McLean's future rentals as an example, and rents could change by the time they are available, there will be 22 apartments at the 80% income eligibility. This means that a two person household must have an income no higher than $80,000 and be able to pay rent of $2,273 a month without being severely cost burdened. McLean will have six apartments at the 50% area median income eligibility. This means that a three person household must have income no higher than about 60,000, 60,400 exactly, and be able to pay rent for a two bedroom of $1,510 without being severely cost burdened. Once a building is about ready for occupants, 
developers must use a management company to issue and review applications for affordable units using a lottery in a system that is state managed. As you've heard, the Housing Trust has created a strong foundation for continued progress in Belmont through a number of recent successful initiatives. We now have an approved housing production plan that spells out our housing needs and community approved strategies. Town meeting approved an updated inclusionary zoning bylaw to maximize opportunity for more affordable housing. Belmont ran the McLean gauntlet successfully and town meeting approved the zoning that will, will result in a fantastic development for Belmont. Town meeting has approved grant funding for the housing trust from the community preservation committee. The trust used CPA funds this past year to provide 82 Belmont households with emergency rental assistance due to income losses from COVID. Town meeting will vote again this spring on a new grant that will allow the trust to help developers expand affordable options, such as by lowering the income eligibility of a unit from 80 to 50% AMI. Finally, here's how to get involved in helping advance affordable housing. As you've already heard, local support is paramount. The next slide provides specific ideas for you on this. We know that building a coalition of broad support with different groups in town is key. As an example of this, we were happy to hear that the Community Path Committee endorses promoting affordable housing near the community path. The Housing Trust has two public engagement activities right now that will, will result in input being provided to the planning board for changes to our zoning. A new state law allows cities and towns to adopt zoning best practices related to housing production by a simple majority vote. This will make it easier to change our zoning and town meeting. The first activity is to work on planning zoning changes for new multifamily housing near transit. You'll hear more about that shortly from Rachel and Jared. The second activity is working on proposed zoning changes for expanding accessory dwelling units, also called ADUs, tiny houses, in-laws or granny flats. These are small units on existing residential property. Nearby Newton passed this in 2017 and Arlington Town Meeting will vote on it this spring. Here are six actions you can take to show support for affordable housing in Belmont. Learn. By listening to this presentation, you're already doing this, and there's always more to learn and plenty of resources. We've included some on the final slide of this presentation for you to go back to later. Speak up in support of affordable housing at public meetings. Catherine's research drives home the point. We need more housing advocates to go on the record at public meetings. Contact your neighborhood town meeting member to discuss affordable housing and the importance of supporting changes to our zoning for more density near transit. Write and post your support in our town paper, on social media, and other information sources that are read by others in town. Engage. The Housing Trust welcomes you to get involved. Really, email me or Rachel Heller to express your interest, and we will be sure to let you know about opportunities to get involved. And finally, these are the members of the Housing Trust. Some are recognized experts in affordable housing, and all are passionate uh, about advancing equitable housing opportunities. We welcome your involvement. Thank you. On behalf of the Housing Trust, I'll say that we look forward to working with you to advance affordable housing in Belmont. The next slide contains a few resources to learn more about the connections between fair housing, zoning, and actions we can take locally to help make Belmont a town of homes for all. Thank you, Betsy and Judy. And we will uh, have these slides posted on the Housing Trust uh, webpage on the town's website as soon as we can. We are now going to change the format a bit into a conversational style. I'm going to have a Zoom side chat with Jared Johnson to talk more in depth about opportunities in, that Belmont has and how these opportunities can help to strengthen our community. Jared is the Executive Director of Transit Matters and board member of Abundant Housing. Jared, thank you so much for joining us. So to get started, um, as you know very well, <laughs> significant housing policies were passed by the legislature and signed by the governor that will require communities served by the MBTA like Belmont to zone for multifamily housing by right within a half mile of transit at 15 homes per acre and suitable for families with children. In addition, as Representative Rogers spoke about earlier, the voting threshold is now a simple majority to put zoning into place that fosters multifamily and other kinds of development that makes communities more walkable and, and more of a smart growth. What do you see as the potential of these new laws? Yeah, I, I hopefully see a lot more housing and a lot more 
um, affordable housing. You know, definitely one of the things that's that's really clear is that um, you know denser housing has got to be uh, a key part of uh, of the solution uh, to affordable housing, the affordable housing crisis, as well as giving folks uh, an opportunity to to live without a car. Um, even just you know having that off of your budget uh, and in terms of of the actual cost of the housing, uh, each parking space uh, can drive up the cost uh, of a unit about twelve. Uh, percent, you know, even as high as 25 percent when you start talking about having two parking spaces per unit. So I think there really is a a, uh, a huge opportunity there. And, you know, as a transit advocate uh, as well, uh, it's how we get more people uh, onto transit. I think, you know, obviously there's there's a, a tension between, um, you know, between park and ride and, you know, using uh, the, the space near stations for park and ride um, and using it for development. But, you know, definitely all the data shows that that having folks live near transit, particularly if it's a low parking uh, building, uh, translates to higher usage of transit uh, and, of course, better air quality and all of the, the benefits that, that come from that. Thank you. Well, related to that, you know, Belmont has two commuter rail stations. We're served by multiple buses. And our town is set up in the way that we have local businesses uh, along the bus routes and at the commuter rail stations. How can we think about these assets as we strive to make Belmont more affordable, diverse, walkable, bikeable, vibrant? You know, why do you, why is this important to Belmont and people who live here now or future residents and, and to the state? Yeah, I think it's really right. critical that, um, you know, that, that, the, that the town sort of you know, starts moving towards the future that it, that it wants to see, right? You know, that if the town wants a future with, you know, where kids can walk to school and where kids can play, um, you know, uh, you know, in the street without having to worry about things like that, or, uh, or, you know, to be able to bike more or to have less traffic, uh, then that means you've got to make those changes in the built environment and Belmont is well-placed with, um, like you said, with their commuter rail, which, you know, hopefully advocates like myself and other folks are pushing to turn that more into a second subway system so that, you know, it's not going to be just to go into downtown Boston, um, you know, at the beginning of the day and back out again, that it will actually be something that you can use all of the time. And as we start to, you know, uh, invest more in bus lanes, that these will be, um, you know, tools that can carry a lot more people. But in order for those to work, um, you know, you've really got to be building the housing that, that makes sense for that. Um, they talk about this in Somerville uh, in a really interesting way, and they talk about that they really try um, to, to minimize uh, the amount of parking um, uh, in, in their new development as much as possible because it undervalues the investments uh, that the city is making in public transportation, in sidewalks, in cycling. You know, every new parking space that you build um, means another car on the street and another person next to you in traffic. So I really think that's a key, uh, you know, part of it. I think, um, you know, the uh, you know, and I'm glad that you mentioned small businesses because um, you know having better cycling facilities, better walking uh, environment, uh, and making things better for transit users is actually better for businesses. There's there's a lot of studies that show uh, that you know cyclists and and folks on foot actually spend more, you know, and some of that is that you just have to sort of, you know, some of it is, you know, if you really think about it, um, those businesses in, in Belmont have already lost out to the people who care the most about being able to park right in front, super easy all the time. Um, and so, you know, making it, um, making it easier for the folks um, who are walking, uh, who are close by, I mean, it just, it's, it's common sense, as well as building housing right on top uh, of some of those um, retail spaces or, or just increasing the density uh, of folks around there that's giving those businesses and those places more uh, more customers and increasing their margins. So, you know, I think it's really critical that, um, you know, that the folks in Belmont, you know, reach out to their um, to their state reps, their state senators, and make sure that, you know, as we're talking about the future of transportation, we're not just talking about changing, you know, what goes into our cars from gas uh, to plugging it in, but that we're really talking about, um, you know, uh, making uh, it easier to bike and walk uh, and get around, uh, you know, Belmont uh, in, in in public transportation or more active transportation modes, because, you know, there's nothing about uh, electric vehicles that are going to make it easier for us to build affordable housing uh, or are going to, you know, um, you know, a lot of what, you know, Catherine Einstein was talking about earlier, you know, one of the main uh, pushbacks is, well, if we built this housing, you know, it's going to be harder to find parking and there's going to be more traffic on the street. And I think oftentimes it is 
you know, an excuse to, to not build housing, but there is, you know, there's some sort of truth to that. And so the, and so the more we can make those investments uh, in public transportation and, you know, and having, um, you know, the developers, instead of building that parking, you know, paying to making transportation better, it really defangs that, that argument. So again, it's, it's why we really need to make sure that the, the transit um, and the, um, the transit is invested in, in such a way that, that it, that it becomes, um, something that you can rely on and something that is no longer an excuse uh, and that the town is making those investments in active transportation uh, to give, you know, to really make it so that you can build that housing with little to no parking. Yeah, you hit on some really big points, you know, that, that definitely resonate here in town. Um, traffic has already been building back up, you know, people are feeling it. And so there is definitely a sentiment that the more homes we build, the more traffic we'll see. You know, I tend to think a lot about how people are also getting pushed out so much right now, right? And so the more, the less homes we build, the more traffic we might see. You know, what, what's your take? Absolutely. No, I, 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 absolutely. That, that um, you know, we, there, there's a, a, a phrase they call, they call it, you know, drive to you qualify. And that is that the housing in our, in our inner city, um, in our, in our inner both, both, you know, even more so now in our inner cities, but in our our streetcar suburbs, of which Belmont uh, is certainly one of them, that, that the housing has gotten so so unaffordable that that folks are driving further and further away. Uh, and so, absolutely, that if you're not building that housing in a place like Belmont, where it is feasible, you know, to to walk to, especially all of the jobs that are now happening in um, uh, in Watertown and in adjacent communities, that you, it is feasible to to bus or bike to those places. Uh, or where it's a shorter train ride uh, into downtown Boston and less less expensive on the commuter rail, that's absolutely adding traffic in terms of, uh, of, of pushing folks further out and so making it to where they have to drive or going to communities that lost their commuter rail in the 70s or 80s. Yeah, and um, something else I wanted to hit on um, is just the importance of Belmont um, and all the communities around here doing more housing. Like, what does that mean to the Commonwealth? for us to actually expand our housing supply. Is it that important to, to the state for us to do that? Absolutely. You know, I, I think one of the things that has been really tough for a lot of communities like Belmont to, to sort of grapple with is that, um, you know, a lot of the folks when they bought their, their homes in Belmont, particularly, you know, some of the folks who've been here for a very long time, 30, 40 years, you know, they were, um, you know, maybe not even middle class, maybe working class when they first brought, bought their homes. And a lot of the folks who bought later on, you know, were, were middle class. Um, but the housing has appreciated to the point where it is not, you know, unfortunately, Belmont is not a middle class um, community. There are plenty of middle class people there. But if everyone in Belmont was to, you know, just get an awesome offer and move down to Florida, the folks who replaced them would not be middle class, not with houses at a million dollars a pop and condos at 70,000. And so I think that there is sometimes a, an uneasiness with, um, you know, with a, a market rate development coming in, you know, in condos for 500,000 or, um, or a, a duplex at 750. And folks will say, that's not affordable. And that's not what we need. Well, but the problem is, though, is that folks who can afford that that price range, if there are not those homes in Belmont, they're either going to go further out and, 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 and you know, drive more cost traffic, or they're going to go to communities like, um, like, you know, uh, the port in Cambridge, or Roxbury, J Jamaica Plain, um, you know, M Malden, all, all of these communities, uh, where there are more renters, um, and where, um, you know, that they will, you know, buy out those, uh, buy out some of those communities. So I think, you know, it's, it's absolutely critical that uh, the Belmont does its part in terms of, uh, of adding that overall housing supply, because, it, you know, housing and, and the affordable housing question is far more complex than supply and demand, but it's not, it's, it's not totally divorced from that. We do have, we are, we have built a, a, you know, minuscule amount of housing compared to the number of jobs that we've created uh, throughout the region. Uh, and so it's it's absolutely critical that uh, housing at all levels are built. And of course, you know, let's let's figure out how to how to build more deeply, deeply affordable housing. Uh, but again, I think communities have to be realistic about sort of you know where they are in the um, you know where they are in the in the, the sort of income and uh, income spectrum when it comes to the kind of housing and the, and the the kind of housing that's on the market there now. Yeah, it's a good question. It's already, um, it's been coming up in the Q&A, which we'll go through in a moment. 
um, just how to create more deeply affordable housing. Because to a lot of people, you know, like you said, it doesn't seem like even the affordable housing is affordable, although you're pointing out it's affordable at different price points, and that's important. What are your thoughts, especially as you know, your past, you've worked for a community development corporation. Um, how do we create more deeply affordable housing? Yeah, I mean, it's it's it, there's got to be more support from uh, from the state and from the the, the federal government. Um, and I think we also have to look at, um, you know, how, as, as Catherine Einstein said, you know, the, um, you know, the, the gauntlet that we put housing through that has a cost, you know, when, when um, either frivolous lawsuits from abutters or lots of design revisions or units being cut down, you know, that all adds to the cost, you know, that is uh, perhaps an extra year's worth of real estate taxes and lawyers uh, that then add to that cost. So, you know, I think the, um, but, but of course, you know, again, the, the, the biggest, the biggest impediment is just the lack of funds that, that um, every year, uh, typically you have close to a hundred projects that apply for, uh, for funding through the, you know, through the, 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 what we call the one-stop um, you know, process that that's where state they, program. right. The state program where the federal and, and local tax credits are, are allotted and about 25 ish to 30 uh, um, projects are allowed to go forward. So that typically means that you're waiting three and a half to four years uh, in order to get your project funded. So um, really, really increasing the amount of, um, uh, of, of, of money that's available uh, is really the key impediment to, to getting that deeply, deeply affordable housing, as well as really looking at, um, you know, and this is a, definitely a controversial one, but, you know, one of the things that, that's a struggle is that um, is building costs. And so we've got to figure out how do we reduce building costs um, and how do we get creative? Some really interesting things are happening in my old neighborhood in Dorchester where they're experimenting with smaller unit sizes. And there's sometimes there's a pushback about why aren't we building, uh, you know, housing for families? And we should absolutely do that. But if we can have folks who can build um, studios and one bedrooms with Either no, either no subsidy or just a little bit of subsidy. Uh, if we can start to do that on scale, you can get people like myself um, out of um, out of triple deckers and out of three and four bedroom apartments and make those available for families. Whereas, you know, um, creating those from scratch is 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 really really an expensive um, ordeal. I was you know lucky enough to get a first time home buyer uh, you know unit uh, and a one bedroom here, but. Um, you know, those are few and, 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 you know, those are few and far between. And so I really think it is an, an, an all about all the above strategy. It's our it's zoning change. It's more money for affordable housing and more money to build that deeply, deeply affordable housing, including for families. And then it's also, um, you know, setting aside smaller pots of money um, and, and doing those zoning changes so that we can have those. Um, you know, I know that Catherine was talking about, you know, the, the trust in developers, but there are some good guy develop good guy and, and good girl developers out there who are, um, you know, who are, who are doing really innovative things. And if we can um, make it easier for them to develop, uh, you know, the kind of housing that again, can, can return some of our existing uh, uh, affordable housing stock, uh, you know, to, to families um, and not to individual college students and, and um, young professionals, that's, that's, um, that's a huge part of the, the equation as well. Actually, I will ask one more question before we open up to the Q&A, because you hit on something that I think is really important and that Catherine spoke about as well, and it's that distrust of developers. So um, because you have such a great history of working on transit and housing, you know, can you just talk just briefly from a developer perspective, just what it's like and you know, how a developer might try to work and why it may appear that the developer is only acting in their own interest? You know, can you just describe a little bit of what about what it's like from the developer side? Because it's not something that we hear a lot. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think folks, you know, um, I, I think that that the all of the different steps that go into development and the costs, I think, are, are unknown. I think that folks think that that, um, you know, that there is just a a ridiculous, um, you know, and sky high markup. And this is not to put out the violin. And, you know, of course, there are some. Um, quite, you know, there are some unsavory uh, development characters who are doing uh, building clear outs and are and who are flipping, uh, flipping buildings. But typically, when it comes to a a new a new ground up building, um, there is not that 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 markup um, that you're thinking about uh, when it comes to material costs. When it comes to uh, and you know, there, are, there some of this is 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 very well meaning and and very good. But Massachusetts has a lot of of regulations. The amount of paperwork. Uh, that you need to fill out 
uh, in order to get a building off the ground is astronomical. And then if it's an affordable housing building, all that paperwork plus the paperwork that you need to do um, to, um, um, you know, to satisfy that, you know, if you are um, building affordable housing, the main way that we fund affordable housing, a lot of folks don't know this, I certainly didn't before I got into the business, is through the IRS. Um, and, and it is, um, and there's a lot of financialization uh, involved in that. And so when you're building an affordable housing building, there are all of the, the lawyers and all of the fees that are involved uh, with that because you're offering tax credits and those are being bought by banks and so on and so forth. Uh, and then again, um, as, as Catherine and other folks have alluded to, you know, that, that, that gauntlet of, of design, um, you know, and a lot of times it, it, it you know, it does, it does, um, um, you know, end up, you know, providing a, a better looking thing or, or, you know, there are benefits that come out of it, but again, there are, there are costs associated to that. And so I think, you know, one of the things that, um, that, that folks have talked about is, you know, how do we have a, a, um, how do we have a more standardized process where, and I forget which city it is, but there's something that's come out with, okay, here are five or six different building types uh, in terms of look and design and feel, and boom, if you can do that, you know, you get a check mark from the, um, you get a check mark from the town council and you're able to move forward. And so that every time you're doing this, you're not reiterating and reinventing the wheel and, and doing it. Right, it's already, it fits in architecturally and that kind of. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And then of course, another key part of this is that we really have to make sure that, that, you know, just as I talked about transportation earlier, that we're also bringing in workforce development to this as well. A, a huge part of the, of the cost uh, for, for housing, um, excluding affordable housing is, is, is labor. Um, and, and that is that we are in a, a incredibly, you know, hot market. Um, and there are so many different different projects and different things going on. And so if you're building housing, you are competing with construction firms and day laborers for um, office, you know, for people building office space and office towers, lab space. I mean, lab space has exploded and has only gotten even bigger um, since COVID. So, you know, how do we bring in, and of course that has a, a, a twofold effect of bringing in, uh, you know, new folks, bringing in, um, you know, um, you know, low-income and, and minority communities bringing in re-entry citizens, um, bringing them into the fold, and 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 um, and you know, expanding that market. You know, will only not only help to bring the cost down, but of course also you know, give folks um, you know who've been who've been locked out of some of those high-growth um, job sectors, give them a leg up. So you know, I think there's a lot of different sort of things that that go into it. But uh, the good thing yeah. is. The, the answers are out there. You just have to get creative and and then provide the the the, the funding so that you know folks who have been you know fighting this fight, um, you know like Bob and others, so that they've got the resources to you know enact the the, the tools that they they already know. You know, so yeah, really I appreciate that. It's here. yeah, there's a lot going on in the development process that it's really hard for anyone to have any sense of what it's like. So that's really helpful to see it from a former developer's perspective. Um, my very last question for you before we transition into the Q and A is. What is your advice for um, people in working with developers to make the kinds of developments that we want to see? Um, you know, we had some really good success here in town with McLean and, and changing that from something that was luxury home ownership to something that was a mix of the rental and home ownership and, and, and a mix of needs being met. Um, what do you think the approach should be when you, when you hear about a development coming to your town? You know, how do you start to work on it? Yeah, I mean, I think I think Belmont should pat themselves on the back because I think that's one of the best ways to do it. I, th I think if you engage with good faith, then a then a good faith developer is 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 going to come back and is going to say, you know what, that that's that that's fine. Because at the end of the day, you know, I, I think a lot of folks sort of attribute, um, you know, more malice, um, you know, to developers. Man, it's it's really just, you know, what 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 can help us get this done faster. And and so if they see that you are engaging in good faith and you're not just saying, you know, let's make this. 100% affordable, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod, um, you know, make it so that it's not feasible to get built. But if you're saying, you know what, we really want to push you on, on this affordability, but in exchange, you know, we, we're willing to fight for this and, and you're going to get support from us. You know, I think most developers, you know, are, are going to be willing to come, you know, to the, to the table on that. So I think it is about engaging in good faith. I think it's about, um, you know, you know, coming up with those, coming up with those, you know, with, with those solutions and, and working together. I think it's, it's, um, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I I think that's 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 the key part. I think you know, really being there and and you know, not not just coming to them with with the problems of you know, housing is unaffordable here. All right, here you know, here's that here's 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 who is in our community. Here's the mix that we think you know can make this work. And the great thing is there are so many um, tools now that are out there that that sort of show you. And obviously, it's it's an online tool that, that's done really quick. But there are tools where you can sort of plug in how many units and land costs and all this, and you can even mock up and say, "Look, no, we've run, we've run the numbers on this. Uh, you know, um, we you know we think you can make this work if you um, and especially if if you're willing to. And this is where it, you know, it does take that that boldness if you're willing to say, you know what, um, you know if if you can. Um, you know, we've been willing to talk about about you know density bonuses, you know, as and density bonuses and and parking reductions, um, and you know, let's put some of that money into the better into better bus service here. You know, let's do that density bonus, but in exchange for that, you know, we want to see affordability. We want to see deeper affordability. Um, you know, I, I think that's those are the kinds of things that you know that can get you that that better working relationship. Because again, I think at the end of the day, most developers, you know. They, they, they want to put up a building with as, with as little sort of sort of trouble as possible. And so even if you're pushing them and even if you are uh, asking them for that deeper affordability and for things that cost them money, if you if they get that sense that they're actually going to be able to get that project through faster uh, and that it's not going to be a lawsuit, I think you'll be surprised uh, at the amount that they're willing to give um, on, 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 on things like you know affordability. That's great. Thank you. I see Bob nodding along. I think another panelist wants to jump in and add to that. Bob, would you like to jump in? And then Betsy is going to help us get through some of the questions that are coming up. Oh, oh yeah. Brother Jared is absolutely correct. We, we've used that methodology in Roxbury. And our experience has been it was easier sometime to deal with the developers than it was the city planners. Uh <laughs> That's not the case here in Belmont. Okay. <laughs> And what we did is we, um, we went to the developers and we opened up direct negotiations with them. And you know, you're know you absolutely right. We came with, we crunched our numbers. Uh, we came with alternatives for design. And what we also said to them was, look, if you give us the kind of housing that we're looking for that fits our demographic needs, uh, here's what we'll do. We'll go with you and lobby for you to get the subsidies that you need. We'll go to the MBTA and lobby to get that bus stop put in front of your development because it's the city of Boston that figures out where the bus stops go and gives the T the provision to put the bus stops in. So we'll do all that lobbying for you if you if you cooperate with us and also we'll recommend you to other other communities because if you're you're good enough you know developer to, to see the value in working with a community in our instance, We'll recommend you to our friends in Rosendale and Mattapan and other places. And say, hey, here's a developer that you, you can work with. So you're absolutely right. Those, those to go, we have changed four or five major developments in our community by doing direct negotiations. That's amazing. Um, well, thank you. Those are, I think that that's really helpful. A lot of uh, people in town think a lot about that when development's being proposed and just how to engage more in that so that we can see more of the development that meets our needs. Um, I'm going to turn it to Betsy for a moment to start going through the Q&A and yeah, we, um, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we've gotten great questions and um, so we'll see what we can do about getting through them all. Um, Bob, I'm going to read one and I wonder if you can answer it. Um, actually, I'll, I'll read two because I think they both fall into the fair housing space. Is there any way to ensure that these new affordable units would go to people of color? Yes, that's one of the debates that I mentioned. Um, when we've negotiated directly with our developers, they agreed with us that, yes, we should be setting aside units in our development for folks in the neighborhood so they won't get displaced. However, the controversy comes up, is that a preference? And by granting that preference, have we injured any other groups? Are we discriminating against any other groups? And a lot of us feel that uh, doing such a set aside is not a violation of the Fair Housing Act, because in fact, it's a remedy for an even bigger fair housing problem, which is the wholesale displacement of people of color out of the city. So we, we see this as, in, in one respect, a, a, 
a uh, remedy for an even bigger fair housing problem. Now, the issue that the developers brought to us in the negotiation was that one of the funders, one of the major funders of affordable housing, I won't say which one, has said to them, oh no, you can't do such a set aside. That's a violation of the Fair Housing Act. And so the city of Boston was able to cut a deal with that funder to quote, try a couple of pilots. But we told the city, we should convene sort of an all-star cast of fair housing experts and meet with, with that particular funder and explain why it's not a violation of the Fair Housing Act. And in fact, we found in some of uh, HUD's other programs uh, that there were um, precedents for doing specific types of set-asides. We've, we've done set-asides before and we've done marketing goals in a lot of our affirmative marketing plans as well. So it's an ongoing controversy with, within the fair housing movement. Great, and um, I'm sure Bob, you know more than I do on this one, but I seem to remember, Rachel, you might remember as well, that when we, um, when we have a set aside in the um, deed restricted market rate and there's a lottery, um, currently in um, our bylaw, there is a local preference given to people who work in town, who attend school in town, but may not live in town. Um, or who live in town. So there's that local preference, and I think that's 70%. Um, and then the remaining number must, those who put their names in the lottery, they must meet the diversity representation in the um, greater Boston area. So probably in that HUD um, census catchment. Um, and so that's where, you know, right now, I think the way our bylaw is set up, it's just that 30% where we would have some sort of um, you know, data-based representation. That 70% is something that Belmont can look at if as a, you know, if as a group we decide values-wise, we wanna take a look at that, that's something that we could discuss. Rachel, do you have any thoughts to answer that question further? Well, communities like Brookline have done, have done that. So, um, you know, I think this is getting at uh, the different kinds of community types that we've got in Massachusetts. We have, communities that are facing great risks of displacement. And then we have communities that, like um, I think Jared was talking about, are really not going to be able to serve more than the people who live there now or, or when people sell their homes, you know, um, higher income households. And so it's different tools that we need to be able to apply in different types of communities. Um, you know, how do you open up communities that have been out of reach? And how do you help people stay in the communities that they've helped to build? Um, in Belmont, you know, we're definitely a community that's out of reach. Um, so it's something that we've got to ponder. Um, I don't know if the panelists want to want to comment on that. We want to be able to help the people, you know, who've helped to build this community stay put, of course, and not lose their homes. Um, and we also need to be able to create more entry points for people who haven't been able to live here. So I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? You know, I, I think um, there's obviously sort of the, the legal definitions, but I, I also do think we've thought about this a lot. I live in Arlington um, and I've thought about this a lot in my own community um, that it, it's a very white community. And so when we have residents preferences for residents in our affordable housing, that means essentially we are giving preference to white people. Um, and so I do think Rachel, you put it really well that there probably should be some conversation about different strategies for re resident preferences if we're looking at communities where displacement is a really serious issue and places that have um, ugly histories of locking out people of color, um, which we only need to look at a redlining map to see which communities in Boston um, did that and have been doing it for decades. And so, um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's something worth having a really critical look at in some of the suburban communities. Catherine, I'm going to ask um, another um, question from someone who attended and uh, maybe I can actually lump a couple of these, but based on your research, um, can you just describe how um, the people who show up at the meetings, um, the neighborhood defenders, how do they end up influencing, um, just describe further, how do they end up influencing the decision if decisions around zoning changes happen at town meeting, but they are showing up at a planning board or a zoning board. So you could- So the decisions about whether housing gets built are mostly made in front of planning or zoning boards. So they're sort of the ones that grant either the special permits or the variances that allow um, for new housing to get built. 
and so um, what happens, I, I mean, to some extent, it's almost like a human process. Um, when you're sitting on one of these boards and everyone in the room, whether it be a virtual room or a you know in-person situation, is telling you that they hate this project and that they think it's going to contribute to traffic and it's going to make the schools crowded and it's degrading the environment, um, you're not, you, your instinct at a minimum is going to be to delay the project by a few months and maybe maybe kill it all together. But at a minimum to say, if you're one of these board members, no, 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 maybe we should reduce the number of units by a few. Um, maybe we should increase the number of parking spaces in order to make sure um, that there isn't sort of strain on on-street parking. Um, and, and that sort of, it's natural, right? To, and when you have a bunch of your neighbors in the, in the room yelling um, about a particular project, um, and sort of what we argue in our research is that those little changes to projects, reducing it by a couple of units, um, you know, in and of itself for any individual project is maybe not such a big deal. But when that process gets repeated hundreds and hundreds of times over in a metropolitan area like Boston, it starts to have a really marked effect on the housing supply in the places where we now need to build it. So that's sort of one place where this is really impactful is that those boards themselves make really important policy decisions. Um, but I saw in the question, one of the other uh, things that they were pondering is like, how does this affect things at like town meeting or how does this affect the decisions at city counselors make. And I would actually argue more with the city councils than with town meeting, those get closer to being majoritarian institutions, um, where I think those community proceedings can still be impactful, but you actually get to consider more sort of town or city level interests at those kinds of proceedings. And like, maybe those get us a little bit closer um, to having representative voices heard. But uh, sort of the dynamics we were especially concerned about are those community proceedings at planning and zoning board meetings where decisions about zoning changes do happen um, and zoning recommendations do occur and project by project decisions about housing developments also happen. Thank you. And um, Jared, I see in the questions that you have um, indicated that you'd be willing to answer a question or two live. Is that something you want to do? For example, do you want me to um, point one out or are you ready, Jared, to answer one? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, point out which which one. You, okay. Uh, you There's know. a question. Is anyone looking at accessibility for the disabled, both with regard to housing and to the commuter rail? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I, I know in, in, in a housing and in affordable housing, there, there are very, very strict um, guidelines. There's a own organization called the, uh, the Mass Architectural Access Board um, that, um, you know, that has to oversee, you know, any any plans. And this is for new construction and for uh, older construction if you're doing a serious rehab. So for housing, you know, not that there are things that they can't be improved, but there is a really strong process around that. For commuter rail, um, you know, that's actually a big part of our um, regional rail advocacy is having accessible uh, platforms because, you know, not only for folks with disabilities, but for, for parents with strollers, for older adults, for anyone with a temporary ailment, or even just folks carrying, you know, heavy bags. Uh, and it also has a huge benefit to the system. And I think there actually is a place where housing development sort of intersects with this, right? That if we are building denser, you know, housing, um, you know, that, that can support more community benefits. And if we're building less of that parking, then some of that money can go towards uh, helping the MBTA make uh, these uh, commuter rail stations accessible. So, you know, they absolutely do go hand in hand. And, and I think absolutely that, that we got to make, we have to make sure that if we are, um, you know, trying to build housing with less uh, parking, uh, that we're making sure that our bus stops are accessible. Um, you know, there's, it, once you get out of, I mean, even some of them in, in, in the core, the core Boston area and, and some of those areas are in pretty sad shape, but especially once you get uh, a few towns outside of it, you know, um, bus stops are just poles in steep embankments and with little sort of, you know, rutted out um, dirt paths. And so we, we really have to make sure that we are, um, um, you know, making transit accessible. Great, thank you. Um, there've been a couple of questions that relate to um, a recent um, override vote that did not pass in town. Um, so if our panelists are not familiar with that, then maybe um, the first respondent could be another panelist who is familiar. Um, I'm gonna read one, but I will say that there's several that have come up. Um, how will Belmont develop both more affordable housing and more commercial business space on a limited land mass? Being a town of homes mean, means we must continue to raise property taxes to pay for schools and public services. 
The last override was defeated because many older residents who came to town as middle class but don't have income to pay for ever increasing pro property taxes. Can we have both more affordable housing and more commercial development? Um, a related question was, um, this brings you know, more housing, brings in more students, this will increase property taxes. So I just wonder if a panelist wants to take on responding to that question. I have one thought on it. Um, and one of the other speakers mentioned that um, building housing above commercial space, we have, you know, quite a lot of very low rise, mostly one story commercial space along Trapella Road, especially, and we could build housing over that and there would be people there to, you know, be in the, those businesses at night and, uh, you know, it could really uh, revitalize some very kind of hanging on, just barely hanging on uh, businesses. So that's that's something we really should look into. Yeah, I agree with Judy and um, please panelists speak in. You all are the experts and we are so fortunate to have you. But I, I think that um, it can often be hard for us to imagine what's not there right now. So it feels built out. Well, it's built out under current zoning. Can we reimagine these spaces? You know, we have um, this great spot right in my neighborhood, Waverly Square, commuter rail, uh, we got a bus to, to Harvard Square. Um, and it just seems like if we reimagine that, it could actually look a lot different and it could support those multiple goals. I don't know if you, I will turn it to the experts mm -hmm. to, to let me know what you think about that. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I think, it, you know, I think we have to, we have to reimagine sort of what, you know, what, you know, what, what fits in. And especially when we start talking about our, our main streets and right on top of, of, of transit, you know, I think, you know, um, a community that's, that, that's, that's right in our neck of the woods, um, Brookline, you know, not that there aren't issues there, not that they're not having their own fights there, but, you know, and there on, on Beacon Street, there will be a, you know, a single family home, then there will be a, you know, a 16 unit uh, apartment and and no one you know no one thinks that that Brookline is any sort of worse for the wear uh, you know because there is this this mix of housing so I think we do really have to um, yeah like you said we we really have to sort of reframe what fits what fit in means um, and, and and sort of really valuing I think one of the one of I've got actually a little sign up in my uh, my window that and I it has a quote that I really love and that is that characters make the neighborhood character you know right that we have to um, you know, and no one is suggesting that all of a sudden, you know, Belmont is just going to be, you know, all of it's going to be 15, 20 story. Building. No one's saying that. But we do have to look at, I think the South End uh, provides a, a really cautionary tale of putting too much uh, emphasis on just the looks and not thinking about the people. And that is that the majority of the South End, you go around and look around it today, it looks exactly like it did in the 1950s. Uh, but uh, with the exception of Via Victoria and a few other places hanging around there, the the Black and Latino families that 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 made the South End vibrant are are gone because there was too much of an emphasis on just just what the the outside um, looked like. And so, you know, I think we we really have to, you know, if Belmont wants to hang on as a as a community that is that is um, that's getting, even getting more diverse and that and that is sort of retaining those families, we do have to look at. Uh, you know, how do we get creative? And again, really putting that emphasis on the characters, on the people themselves. That's really helpful. Um, I'd like to jump in unless Bob would, because I saw Bob nodding along <laughs> over there. Uh, Bob, did you want to say anything? Well, I just had to chuckle at, at a couple of things I heard. One, I'm a former South Ender. I'm a, refu I'm a refugee of urban renewal. Yeah. And that's what really wiped out the uh, Black and Latino communities in my neighborhood was urban renewal. It was a very conscious policy. Uh, to move us out and to consciously gentrify the neighborhood. But the other thing I was kind of chuckling at was um, every time um, Professor Einstein would, would come up with her list of, of what people were doing to defend their community, I had to laugh because I said, we've used the exact same tactics yeah. in communities of color, but we've used it to stop gentrification and displacement. So it, it goes back to the issue of, we have all sorts of strategies and tactics, but we got to make sure we're using the right ones in the right locations yeah. at the right time. That's a good point. I and really then, appreciate you raising that point, Bob, because it's one of the things I, you know, we, we get asked about this a lot in our research sort of, 
what what do you think about neighborhood opposition to new development in places like Roxbury, for example? And my answer is always that we should think about those conversations really differently because some communities have just been predated by developers and have borne the overwhelming brunt of development pressures. And you know, Washington DC, I think is another really, really good and powerful example of this, how some neighborhoods have been the target of development because uh, they haven't had sort of privileged folks who have showed up and tried to protect, you know, their beautiful little brownstones and townhomes and everything else, right? You know, to get back to Jared's point about preserving um, architecture rather than sort of the people who live in those places. And so I, I think it's really important to distinguish sort of when we're thinking about community opposition um, and community meetings, what are communities where we might want to actually think seriously about protecting them from development and what are places, where are the places we should develop? Um, the other point I wanted to make in response to sort of Rachel's question um, about um, sort of the development in these communities is everyone thinks they're built out. Um, this is, you know, if you go to, um, yeah, I was recently just up in the North Shore um, where there are all sorts of signs next to the commuter rail stations up there opposing various 40B projects. Um, nobody in thinks like, wow, I have lots of room in my community to build, you know, big developments. Like everyone thinks they're built out. And so I, I think for all of these communities, we need to think creatively um, about how we can build, especially near transit stations. So thank you. Um, I wanted to pick up on a part of Betsy's question that was getting at the cost. You know, so often um, people see development, housing development as more costs, and we don't think about the benefits. And it was interesting, we went through the process with McLean. One of the things that we found after lots of different analyses is that it's actually bringing in some net revenue for our community. Um, but what else, you know, how, how do we start to see that this is a benefit for our community and not just worry about the cost? Any thoughts on that? I think it's, I think it's storytelling, right? I think it's, I think it's thinking about all of these 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 new neighbors, you know, these new folks who can get involved uh, in the civic organizations, you know, for the, for those businesses that you know that, that you love, you know, restaurants especially operate on threadbare margins, and so those are more folks who are who are going to be able to patronize um, those restaurants. I think it's also about thinking about how you know Belmont um, and a lot of other communities have become places where um, you know your kids are going to have to to leave um, you know when they come back from college they're they're you know likely not going to be in Belmont and so how how do you make housing um, you know that 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 the kids can be a part of or when mom you know when mom you know needs to needs to downsize um, you know finding a finding a a, a place. Um, you know, for her, that is, um, you know, that doesn't have stairs and isn't isn't huge to, you know, to downsize. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's 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 thinking about it um, in, in in that perspective, and it's also really looking at the data. I mean, I know that that, that school, um, you know, that, that that school size or or you know, adding more more people to the to the school is definitely a huge concern. But I mean, all of the data shows smaller families. You know, shows you know, um, you know, younger, younger folks, my generation having kids less, uh, having kids later. Um, and so I do think we have to, you know, we, we have to, to really think about um, what, what the data is showing us about who's at, who's actually moving in uh, to these developments and, and that it's, and that it's, it's not going to, to be the, the Armageddon on our, on our schools or on our infrastructure. And particularly when you think about, you know, if you build, if you, you know, if you're building dense housing and, and you are, you know, doing all of the, um, you know, the town planners and the folks are doing the, the vetting that they need to do, it's actually, you know, it's it's more efficient than, you know, trying to extend out the water main to serve, you know, lower density single family uh, development. So I, I think it really is about, it's a mixture of storytelling, it's a mixture of data, uh, and it's a mixture of, of having that sort of um, asset-based thinking and sort of a deficit, instead of a deficit-based thinking. Yeah, and um, thank you for hitting on the on the school uh, cost piece. This comes up a lot, and um, you know we talk a lot in town about the fact that we simply, you know, Bob, you can correct me as the as the fair housing expert here. We simply cannot make decisions about housing or zoning based on familial status or that there there could be children moving in. It's just actually not allowed by law. Um, so uh, you know, putting that into place and just understanding that we can't do that then you can look at some of the research around it. So our planning agency looked at building permits and school enrollment and saw no correlation. You know, we, we, the thing that drives 
increase in school enrollment is having good schools. We have great schools. We just ranked in the top 10, you know, last week. Um, people want to come here. And whether we build or not, we will get more children here because people want to come here. Um, so that, Bob, I don't know if you want to add on to that or Representative Rogers, who also knows the, the law well, please feel free to comment. You no, know, I was just thinking to some of the battles we've had in Boston around the schools. And isn't it still the case, and maybe Representative Rogers can answer this better than I, but isn't it the case that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts reimburses cities and towns if they build a new school? Well, there's the Mass School Building Authority that uh, does help pay a significant portion of new construction. Um, it's funny, I mentioned we were doing the budget till 2.30 in the morning this morning, and I spent a good amount of time with John Lawn from Watertown. And, um, you know, they have more developable land and uh, have had a building boom, really, in Watertown, right next to Belmont. And they are building their new high school. Um, uh, they just built three new um, um, schools without assistance. So it just goes to show the, 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 the challenge that Belmont has because there is a limited capacity uh, of developable land. Um, you know, um, where would you put it? Uh, I think there was a discussion earlier of you know, mixed use development, that's a great idea. But I do think there's a, a constraint in terms of actual space, uh, unless you go up. Um, and, and, and that may be a debate that lots of folks in Belmont want to have. I mean, um, not, not towering huge skyscrapers, but, you know, a little higher than, than, what, than what we see now. They want to put the skyscrapers in Roxbury. That's what we're fighting. <laughs> well, um, I will. I do want to just bring kind of a couple of thoughts together. Um, this is a fair housing presentation, and I think as we're starting to talk about um, um, what would it take to create more affordable housing in town, and this what we've heard in some of the questions of how would we do this in a way to um, become a welcoming and dynamic community and to bring in more diversity into our town. Um, you know, I think it does all start with those who are on the call um, getting involved. And there was a comment made where maybe it's not just conversations and meetings about housing that we want, but how do we also talk about commercial space? Because we all know that these do need to go hand in hand. Um, so I really do welcome people coming into the, um, the upcoming public meetings that the Housing Trust and hopefully other groups in town will um, jointly do with us. Um, it'll be a little challenging perhaps with uh, virtual, but I think um, as Catherine said, we've all gotten kind of used to it over the past year um, to engage people. Um, Rachel, I wonder if you want to pick another question or if you have other thoughts to wrap. We're just about. I definitely have other thoughts to wrap, but we can do one more question. Um, and because I know that a lot of people have had them, and I want to, I want to be able to give people time. Um, there's a question just about um, vetting developers. So the question is, what steps can Belmont take to vet developers to try and minimize situations like we've had in this one development where it's taken forever to get built, and now there's a lawsuit around the commercial space, and so you know it's really frustrating to see the development still not be done. Um, so what steps can Belmont take to vet developers um, and get the kind of construction that was originally proposed? Uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, I think it goes back to a lot of what you might have been saying before, Jared, about really working with the developers early on, right? What are your thoughts? I mean, the Cushing Square thing that we'd have, I think, is a, is a longer history behind, but in mm -hmm. general, Setting, yeah, developing. you know, I, th I think it's like, like, like I was saying, I think it's working with the developers, uh, you know, ahead of time and, and really sort of, you know, re really assessing them, you know, I mean, it's, and some of this stuff is, you know, going to be, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to avoid it, you know, companies go under, but I think one of the key things too is, is that, is having, having that, um, I keep on doing that. <laughs> having the zoning um, and, and and having the the building typology and having having some of these things actually set out ahead of time, right? That 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 you know what we're looking for here is you know we're looking for um, you know we're looking for an active commercial tenant, you know, versus a bank. You know, we're looking for you know 
for, you know, we're looking for four or five stories here. You know, it's, it's a main corner on the intersection. You know, um, you know we're looking for, um, you know, for a decent, you know, level of affordability. I think having those things, you know, sort of stipulated so that whoever's walking in as the next developer, if one goes under, they, they know what they're walking into. Um, and they know that if they, if they want to get this, um, you know, passed without having to, you know, without having to go through a bunch of, uh, of hoops or without having to do lawsuits and, and drag out the development, they know they're walking into this, that if they build what was originally um, set there, um, you know, they know they're going to get the zoning versus having everything be a bespoke, um, you know, agreement that then is sort of, you know, gone, um, you know, once the, um, uh, once a developer pulls out or, or collapses. Yeah, but, uh, thank you. That's a really good point. Um, I think, uh, you know, the point that you're making is really about by right development, which is what we'll, we will need to think about how we want to do that, you know, uh, because of the new state law and also because it's part of our housing production plan and it's a way that we can move forward. Um, but this gets back to the idea of we can either plan development or development can happen to Belmont. So, you know, acknowledging that we do need to grow, let's think about how to do that in a way where architecturally we like how it looks. Um, and it adds to that that vibrancy and that mix of commercial tax base that we want to see. And, and we really show the meaning behind all of the amazing Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate signs and all of the you know support we see for being more inclusive here in town. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for attending tonight. I want to thank our amazing panelists. This really, you really are an all-star group. And we are so fortunate that you took time today to come. So thank you to Bob Terrell, Jared Johnson, Catherine Einstein, Representative Rogers, of course, who always makes himself available, um, and to the Housing Trust members, Betsy and Judy. Um, and I also want to thank our sponsors, Belmont Human Rights Commission, Belmont Against Racism, and Belmont Media Center. We will, uh, one, as we said, this is being recorded, so Belmont Media Center will be able to play it again, and we will post materials on the Housing Trust page of the town's website. Um, but please stay in touch. We, again, our information is on the town's website. We will be starting some in community some community engagement uh, conversations and processes around the new multifamily zoning requirement. Um, Catherine Bonfiglio, did you want to step in and say something? I thought I heard something from our one of our sponsors. No. Okay. Well, with that, I just want to thank you all again. No. Uh, we look forward to engaging. Oh, Catherine. Charlene has had her hand up. If you wanted to oh, ask. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Um, if Charlene can be brought in, and then we will leave it with. Her final words. Hi. Hi, Charlene, we hear you. Okay, I'm Charlene O'Connor, and I feel like you've been talking about me all night. I moved here 35 years ago, and uh, I had a teacher's salary, and I was able to buy a home, which I couldn't do now in town. And um, three years ago, I was a mom, an empty nester, and decided to uh, downsize, and I was looking for an apartment. And it was in the winter and there weren't many apartments available. And uh, it was recommended to me that I look at the new development called the Royal Belmont. And that was built on land that I had never wanted to have developed. And it was because we wanted more green space. It wasn't to keep people out of town. We were just thinking of, of the green, beautiful forest that was here. So I eventually did come over here and I was blown away. The diversity, the languages, the cultures, it really fascinated me and I love it. And I, I just want people to know, and it really has created uh, more diversity in our schools and on the streets. People who've lived here have gotten involved with the town government. And I think that's about it. I really would say to anyone who is, what is it called? A neighborhood defender, that our neighborhoods, which in the past at times look pretty boring, you know, walking the streets, there's no one around or everyone looks the same. And I, I think it's, it just, could create a place that's more culturally, racially. Oh, and then the affordable housing aspect, which is so important to us because the Royal Belmont has 60 units, I believe. 
that are affordable. And they just blend in with everyone else. I don't know who has them. And I just, I just have uh, making a plug for such development if we can manage it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlene. I think those are wonderful words to end on. Um, you can always reach out to Betsy and me if your question was not answered tonight. I'm not sure we got through all of them. So please reach out and we will uh, get back to you. But thank you so much, everybody, for your time. And thank you for our wonderful panelists. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Take Pleasure care. Pleasure the stage. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you, Representative. Thank you.